Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 10. Uh, I w- was honored to be able to teach Daniel in my Sunday school class, so Daryl, as he was planning his vacation, asked me a couple months ago if I'd be willing to give a sermon on Daniel chapter 10. And I said, I would love to. Daniel t- chapter 10 is one of my favorite chapters in Daniel, actually. If you look at Daniel chapter 10, it's written much like a- an action movie. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, we-, we see battles going on. We even see Jesus Christ himself make an appearance in this chapter. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, please join me in prayer. Uh, Father God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophetic accuracy of your word. We thank you for the truth it contains. And Father, we thank you for this book, the book of Daniel, which is so full of of your truth and your love and and, and gives us an insight on what's going on behind the scenes. And Father God, I just ask that as we take this time to study your word together, that Father, your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. And Father, we'll put all things aside and just spend this time focusing on you. Father God, we love you. It's your Son, Jesus Christ, precious name I pray. Amen. We're going to jump right off the bat and jump straight into Dan- Daniel chapter 10. <clears throat> uh, it, as I said, it's much like an action movie, so as I read through this, uh, follow along closely because a lot of things are happening. Uh, chapter 10, starting in verse 1, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. Right off the bat, we're told that this is in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. You say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Quickly, turn back with me to Ezra. Ezra chapter 1. In chapter 1 of Ezra, we see Cyrus, king of Persia, issuing the first proclamation for the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. In Ezra 1, it says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So remember, this is the first year. Uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So we see the first year of the reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, He signed a proclamation so the Jews could go back and rebuild this temple, rebuild their temple. Here in Daniel chapter 10, it's in the third year, so two years have passed since this time. And and we we find Daniel uh, during this time uh, using the name Belteshazzar. And you ask yourself, why is he using Belteshazzar? Well, I can think of a couple reasons. This time now is about 536 B.C., and Daniel is pushing 90 years old. Daniel is an old man at this time. Uh, older, I should say. As I get older, 90 starts sounding younger. But he's an older man, let me put it that way, at, the, at this time. And, and, and he, he must be, I wonder if he's thinking that he'll never make it back to Jerusalem because of his age. So he's going to use his slave name or his captive name. It could also be to remind us this is the very same Daniel that was taken captive as a teenager under Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whenever, the, whenever the Babylonians came, uh, came and, t- and took him captive. But regardless, he, he's using this, 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 this old name of his, and also he says there's a great battle. This is about a great war going on. Uh, do you believe there's a spiritual war going on today? Is anyone? I think you just have to look in the news. You know, I was watching just this morning in the news. It was talking about a young man that actually started reading the Bible in public, and he was attacked by a mob, and they stole his Bible from him. Do you know what they did? Did anyone see this in the news? This shows you the spiritual battle that's going on. The the witnesses of it, the one that was recording it in the newscast, said after they stole the Bible, something bizarre happened. They started, they ripped the pages out. They started eating the pages of the Bible. Now, why would somebody, isn't that bizarre? Well, it's because there's a spiritual side going on here. There's a spiritual battle going on. There's demonic activity here. Uh, this, the, these, this mob that, that was so upset with hearing the word of God snatched his Bible, ripped the pages out, and started eating it. That is the spiritual battle that Daniel is talking about here that's going on and raging uh, this morning. 
You ever notice whenever Daryl's in his sermon and he's getting ready to drive home an important point, all of a sudden the microphone pops or the lights go out or something happens? Daryl, do you remember? Does that ever happen to you, Daryl? Yeah. That's a spiritual battle. That's not just coincidence. That's Satan doing the very same thing we see happening here. He's trying to prevent the message of God from being heard. And that's what's happening right here in this book of Daniel. Continue with me in verse 2. It says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. Three weeks is 21 days. Keep in that mind because we read a little bit later 21 days is used. But Daniel's in mourning. I love to go back to the, the Hebrew in the Old Testament, the Greek in the New Testament, because you learn so much. It's difficult in our language. Some words are difficult to translate. For instance, the word love is difficult to translate because there's seven or so words for love in the Greek language. And we just say love in English. So all those words gets translated into one word, love. You can say, I love pizza. I love the Colts. And I love my wife. All those loves have different meanings and actually would have had different words in Greek. In Hebrew, the word that was translated here for mourning is the same Hebrew word that's used in Genesis 37, 34. And it's describing someone that is deeply mourning over a loss of a loved one. That's how deep this mourning is. It's not just he was sad. He was in deep mourning. It's also used as a participle. And what that means is that it's a continual. It's a continual state of mourning. So Daniel is in a continual state of this deep mourning, this gut-wrenching mourning, like when someone has lost a loved one. And we're not told why he is in mourning. I can guess why he's in mourning. Uh, as I'd mentioned, the Israelites were sent back to Jerusalem, and they were facing a lot of confrontation, a lot of opposition to rebuild the temple. Actually, during this time, they had halted rebuilding the temple. Israel still was not in good spiritual shape, so he could have been very upset over the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. The other thing is his age. Daniel was not able to make it back to Jerusalem. He could be mourning because he's not able to make it back to the holy city and see the temple rebuilt. Also in the next verse, it's going to mention that this is the first month of the year. Uh, the first month is a month of Nisan uh, in the Hebrew calendar. And Passover begins on the 15th of Nisan. So this is occurring during Passover also, which may also be a reason that Daniel is mourning because of the spiritual condition uh, of Israel and all that's going on. But regardless, we read that he's in deep mourning. And not only is he mourning, he is doing what we would call a partial fast. Uh, he's fasting from the, the delicacies, the rich food, the fine wines, the, the, the good-smelling cologne that they would put on. Because remember, Daniel was blessed by God. Whatever king he was serving under, he always found favor in the eyes of that king. And Daniel would often eat the same rich food, the delicate foods, as the kings would eat. He would anoint himself with the same oil the king would anoint himself with. However, during this time of mourning, we find out that for three weeks, Daniel has done nothing but, in my opinion, probably drink water and eat bread and not anoint himself with any of that fine-smelling fragrance, fragrance he was used to. If we continue in, in verse 4, it says, On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the, the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Boy, what a sight Daniel gets to see here. I want to draw your attention to the fact he says, I lifted up my eyes, or I looked up. That's telling me what Daniel saw was up. It was above the river. It was potentially in the clouds. We don't know how high up, but we know that Daniel lifted his eyes and looked up, and he saw King Jesus, I believe. He saw the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ uh, in the clouds or above the waters as he was looking above the river. You may ask, well, why do you think it's Jesus? 
Well, John saw Jesus in a very similar manner in Revelation. Um, if you turn to Revelation uh, 1, we're going to start in chapter 12. Um, chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 12. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. Now, this is John speaking. And he says, And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a gold sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like that roaring of many waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And then when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. What a powerful image to see. This is the same Jesus, I believe, Daniel's seeing here in chapter 10, as we just read about in Revelation. Well, you may ask me, well, well, wait a minute. Daniel's the Old Testament. How's Jesus in the Old Testament? Do you remember the opening of the Gospel of John? John 1, beginning in first verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Uh, you can easily translate or switch the word word there with Jesus because this is all about Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. And Jesus was with God in the beginning. I love Micah 5 2 also. It's a referencing to the eternity of Jesus. Micah 5 2, this is a prophetic uh, statement about the coming Messiah. It says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratah, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is uh, from of old, from ancient days. This pre incarnate Christ that we see Daniel witnessing here, uh, that is the Christ from the beginning. This is the Christ from ancient days. And God has allowed Daniel to see him during Daniel's time of mourning. Let's continue in verse 9. It says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, And I retained no strength. Then I heard the sounds of his words. And as I heard the sounds of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Daniel's saying, I turned white as a ghost. Not only did I turn white as a ghost, I fell face first on the ground and passed out whenever he saw Jesus. Isn't it interesting that even today, when people are met with Jesus in the Word, or when in Scripture, when people come face to face with Jesus, you typically see one of two reactions. You either fall on your face, or you run and hide. And that's the same exact thing that happened here. Uh, Daniel fell on his face. The rest, they ran and hid. Also notice uh, that uh, Daniel's reaction here, the same as John, he's passed out. If this were a movie... Or if this were on television, it'd be a commercial break. If this were a play, it's in act one. The curtains would drop, and the next scene is getting set. The reason I bring that to mind is because I want to make it clear that the next angel that touches Daniel is not the pre-incarnate Jesus that he saw in the clouds. Daniel's completely unconscious right now. Daniel is completely out of it. And now the curtain rises on scene two in verse... um, Starting in verse, uh, where are we at? Starting verse 10, it says, And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright for now. I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. So we see Daniel has passed out, the curtain has risen. And now we have a a new character on the scene. 
we have an angel that is touching Daniel. And note the, lo- the words this angel uses. He says, Daniel, man greatly loved. Well, that's the words we all need to hear this morning, I think. And I think this, this passage is, is actually written to all of us this morning. Because if you think about it, each of us in this room are greatly loved. I mean, look at the sacrifice that, that, that God made just so we could have this relationship with him. So these same words spoken by this angel to Daniel, I believe God is speaking to us today. O oh, man, woman, greatly loved. And then what's interesting, too, is uh, it's starting in verse 12. We get a little bit of background about why this angel's here and, and, and what all's going on. It says, and starting in verse 12, he says, Then he said to me, um, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first days that you set your heart to understanding and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Did you catch that? From the very first day that Daniel humbled himself and before God and understood God, in other words, when Daniel's heart was right with God and when he humbled himself before God, God heard his prayers. And I tell you, the prayers are of a, from a humbled heart are a powerful thing. The prayers from a, someone that is following the will of God has humbled themselves before God is just as powerful today as Daniel's prayer was back then. Because do you realize that sin actually creates noise or background noise that prevents God from hearing our prayers? So if your prayers aren't being answered, you probably want to ask first, what's my life like? Because sin separates us from God. Sin puts a barrier up between us and God. Sin puts noise between us and God. So God cannot hear our prayers. I like uh, James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I also love, the, in, in the, back in the New Testament, in the book of John, there's a, a gentleman who had been blind since death. Uh, and this is John chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 30. But blind since birth. Thank you, I said death. Thank you, JB. I got JB up here to correct me when I make mistakes. So <laughs> he is blind since birth, not death. That doesn't make any sense at all. So he is blind since birth. And he has never seen anything. And he is healed. And, uh, and no one can understand, at least the Pharisees, how, how did Jesus, who is this Jesus that healed him? He's been blind since he was born. Who, who is this, uh, this, this man that Jesus healed? And, and, and who is Jesus that was able to do that? So they pull him aside and they interrogate him, trying to figure out who this Jesus is that healed him. And he replies in verse 30, he says, The man answered, and he's answering these Pharisees who are trying to interrogate him, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. And then he really gets to the point here, I think. He drives this point, probably had to made the Pharisees feel about that tall. He says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. So again, all of this is reference to the point that God, the power of prayer of someone that's, that's right with God and is humbling themselves before God is a powerful thing. And just like Daniel, you've seen the response from Daniel's prayer. He actually gets to see the pre-incarnate Christ. And not only that, a message is, is being delivered to him. Let's jump back into Daniel. We'll start in verse 13. It says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand that it is to happen to your people and what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. Latter days, that's reference to the end times. God is sending Daniel a message, which Daryl's going to preach on next week because this is actually setting the stage for the actual vision that he receives, which we'll, he'll talk about in chapter 11. But what he's, this vision is about, it's about the future, about the end of times about the days yet to come. And if you note here, it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Also, Michael, who we know as an angel, is referred to as a prince here. And it mentions kings of Persia. 
I want to call your attention to these are not human princes and kings. Uh, These are spiritual entities. Uh, We know that Michael is an archangel for God. He is on the good side. Also, we see this prince or this angel of Persia, as well as these kings of Persia. All of these are evil beings that are doing everything they can to prevent God's message from being delivered to Daniel. Just like they are today, these angels are warring today, trying to prevent God's message from being delivered to the world. Notice how long that they've been fighting, 21 days. You need to make note of that, because remember, Daniel's been fasting for 21 days or three weeks. Uh, This whole battle started the minute Daniel prayed. God sent a message through an angel, and he was uh, in the middle of a fight trying to get that message to Daniel. Now, we don't know what these angels' fights look like. Uh, We don't know what they fight with or how they fight, but clearly there's a battle going on here. And clearly Satan does not want Daniel to hear God's message. The other thing to keep in mind is that a a prayer with a delayed answer does not mean it was not answered. I'm sure Daniel was wondering if God was going to hear him. Well, God, the minute he heard the prayer, sent the answer. There was just a little bit of a conflict to get the answer to Daniel. So keep in mind that just because your prayer is not heard immediately or answered immediately does not mean that it was not heard. Also, where this is taking place is where modern-day Persia is at. Uh, so that's or where modern-day Persia is at in Iran. That's the area that this is taking place. And I guarantee you to this day there's still a battle going on between these demonic beings and the Jewish nation and, and, and something very similar going on as well as, I believe, in, in our own nation Let's continue, Uh, starting in in, in verse 15. It says, When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face to the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me. And no breath is left in me. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're just so overwhelmed with all that's going on around you? All this, the battles that's raging, all that's going on in the world, and and there's just no strength left in you. You're just completely overwhelmed. Uh, That's the same way that Daniel felt. But keep in mind during this time, Daniel is going to be strengthened. And we have access to that same strength. And that strengthening comes about starting in verse 18. It says, Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me, and I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak. For you have strengthened me. I think all of us need to hear those words today. O oh, man or woman greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And those words strengthen Daniel. And I pray those words strengthen each of us today as, as we are facing similar battles in our lives and the spiritual war that's, that's waging around us. You know, I can't help but think of Romans eight twenty eight. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, God is in full control. God is in control all along. I believe God had allowed these angels to fight against this messenger, these demonic angels. He allowed that to happen because I think maybe he was teaching Daniel a little bit of patience. And Daniel gets this message 21 days afterwards. Daniel then continues uh, this account of of this event that's setting the stage for this vision, starting in verse 20. He says, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of the truth. There is no one who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. 
Think about that. Satan has got an entire army trying to prevent a message from coming. And look, it just takes Michael and this other angel. It's all it takes to stand up against them. Again, it shows you who the victor is, who is the one in most power, who is the greatest. Also, the other thing I was wanting to point out that if you remember in Daryl's sermon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had this statue, and it revealed the different kingdoms that would be coming. It started with the Babylonian Empire. Then it went to the Medo and the Persian Empire. Then it went to the Greek Empire. Notice this, this, angel, this other demonic angel that th he's having to go back in battle because he says, Am I, I'm not only going to go back and, and fight the, the prince of Persia, but the prince of Greece is yet to come. That tells us, tells me, that these nations, uh, these empires, have demonic leadership trying to lead them astray. Do you think there are demonic armies influencing the leaders of the kingdom of the United States today? Do you think there is a prince of the kingdom of the United States today? Just look around you. Look at the LGBT movement and its attack on the church. Look at the abortion movement. Look at the desire to, legal, to legalize drugs. Look at the rampant sexual immorality. Look at the violence and the lawlessness that surround us. Look at the attack on Christianity. Look at the desire to even remove the police so there is no law. Look at the desire to even remove a cross from a Christmas tree in a town square just down the street because of this spiritual battle going on. You know, we need to wake up. I think many of us, remember the story of Martha and Mary and how Martha was so consumed with the everyday things that she missed Jesus sitting in front of her? I think Satan does the same thing to us. I think if we get so consumed with all the stuff going on around us, we don't see the spiritual battle that's, that's right at our front door or in our own homes. But remember, that we get strength from God to fight these battles. In closing, on the, in your uh, bulletins, uh, I, I've, I've got five main points. This comes from my background of, of lecturing. I always like to close with some points. There are five main points that I want you to remember and take home with you. The first one is God hears your prayers when you submit to his authority and humble yourself before him. I also got thinking of this, and I got thinking of the cell phone. You know, I'm driving down the road, and I'm talking to my wife on the cell phone, and suddenly it starts cutting out. You can tell when it's starting to cut out. You start losing it, and then you just, they're gone. That's what sin does to our phone conversation to God in prayer. It's like you hit a dead zone whenever you've got sin in your life. So it's important that when we pray, that we submit to the authority of God, and we humble ourselves before him. And that will get you more bars on your cell phone to God, is another way to look at it. Also, know that each of you are greatly loved by God. Everyone in this room is special. God created everyone with a purpose. This is why it breaks my heart to see such a desire for abortions today. God created a life inside of a woman for the purpose of something that he has planned for that life. That life is greatly loved, and yet we just throw it out like everyday trash. Everyone here is greatly loved by God. He gave his son for each of you. The third point is there is a spiritual battle raging around you. It's not fiction. It's not made up. There is a spiritual war that's being fought in our nations, in our schools, in our homes. Why else do you think they've got drag queens coming to read to kindergartners and first graders? It's a spiritual war, I'm telling you. And we need to be aware of that and have our right, hearts right with God and submit to him in prayer. When we recognize this battle going on, the other point I want you to remember is only God can strengthen and protect you in this spiritual war. Uh, during this battle, it is God's strength and protection you need. You can't fight it on your own. And finally, always know God is in control. If something happens, it's, just be, it's because God has allowed it to happen. God is in full control of everything that's going on around us. 
As we read, Jesus Christ himself was planned from, the, from before the beginning of time. Jesus was God's plan all along. And Jesus has been with God since the beginning, as Daniel even saw him in the Old Testament. 